Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, so uh, I have the pleasure of having a foot in two camps. Uh, on the one hand, I'm an academic at the University of Liverpool in the UK, and on the other, I'm uh, a jointly appointed principal scientist at the uh, International Livestock Research Institute in Nairobi. So it's a, a real honor and privilege to represent both those institutions here. So good afternoon, and thank you to the organizers very much for the invitation to attend here. Um, compared to this morning, as we've heard, I'm going to, um, well, this thing took a very necessary and insightful global uh, approach to things, uh, the world view. And the view that I'm going to provide is somewhat more local. Uh, my team's approach to thinking about surveillance in a more localized context, uh, research-based surveillance, but that can hopefully evolve into a more sustainable surveillance system uh, for a national government perspective. Uh, I'm going to use uh, an example from the corner of Kenya, one of the corners of Kenya where we're doing a lot of our work. And also, uh, I'm going to talk mainly about endemic zoonoses uh, rather than the pandemic uh, emerging viruses that we heard about this morning. So, uh, we're discussing people, animals, zoonoses, and their environment, and really what I'm going to provide for you is a, a sort of overview of the approaches that we use to do this kind of surveillance at this local scale. Um, it's a, an interdisciplinary research program investigating zoonotic pathogens at the livestock, uh, wildlife, and human interface. Uh, it aims to address veterinary public health and biological questions. Uh, and it's very much at the population scale. So I'm an epidemiologist, and this is very much epidemiology at, at the, the scale of the population. And importantly, I th the, the vision that I have, the way that we're doing this kind of uh, surveillance, I think is something that we can port out and take somewhere else uh, to, to repeat. And I have, I have this great idea that we might do this in 50 or 60 locations across a transect uh, across sub-Saharan Africa, for example. If anybody in the audience wants to give us funding to do that, that would be great. Um, right, so uh, the one location where we're doing this at the moment is in Western Kenya. And um, the figure you'll see up there really says why. That corner of the Lake Victoria a crescent ecosystem has the highest human population density in East Africa and also the highest livestock population density in that region. Uh, so it's a, a place where lots of potential interaction between those groups can be going on. It's a smallholder crop livestock production system, which means people in, in general are keeping a few animals uh, rather than big, uh, big herds. Uh, and we've been making a long-term investment in, in this study region with several ongoing cross-sectional and, and longitudinal studies. Oops. Yeah. So uh, that uh, that uh, represents uh, a selection of randomly selected households that, that are in our study area, which we uh, monitor uh, 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 periods of time. And importantly, and as we'll see as I go through these slides, we're not just focused on people in their households, but also the wider healthcare system, and here uh, also in the sources of food that people eat and that gets traded. So uh, we, we're targeting our surveillance not only at people, but also at the products, the livestock source products that people are producing and selling. So this is a, a typical household in that part of the country uh, in Kenya, where uh, you can see already within that um, many interesting different components. And what I'll do now is just talk you through some of those components of the household. So first of all, the household itself. So that, that circle represents the, the house. And the house has some important characteristics that we need to understand to put it in the context of the other, the other households and the other people who live in that region. So at the household level, we collect and study uh, data on general characteristics of the household, the management of the home, significant events that they have uh, been um, exposed to, and importantly, try and understand the economic status of those, uh, those residents uh, by collecting, by, by deriving uh, an asset index. And just to, uh, just to show you, these, this is a, I mean, don't worry too much about the detail, but uh, the reasons why I'm showing this will, will uh, become clear a bit later. This is a, a sort of map of the socioeconomic position of people uh, as described by their ownership of different assets. So nothing super rocket sciencey about this, but it, w the, the point is that it's really important when doing these kinds of detailed focus studies to understand where people sit within a socioeconomic spectrum and understand the extent to which those things matter to their exposure to disease. 
Next, uh, within the household, there are domestic livestock. Uh, and it, we undertake uh, surveys of those livestock, sampling them at the household level. All the livestock essentially are, are, are sampled and a number of different types of sample being collected from those animals as subjected then to, uh, to a number of different assays for a range of different diseases. And all of this is biobanked, by the way, if anybody would like access to this sort of material, uh, you're very welcome to make a request for that. It is open access, um, open access on demand. Um, this is a short list of the first pass for many of the pathogens that we, we look at, and you'll notice that there are parasites on there, there are viruses, uh, protozoa, uh, and, and other things. Um, the point here is that we're undertaking this kind of surveillance very comprehensively uh, and trying to understand the totality of the burden that these animals uh, are, are being exposed to, and people. So this list, uh, I haven't distinguished in the, in the uh, interests of One Health between animal and human diseases here. So this, the, there's a range of parasites, a lot of parasites, but lots of other things too, and many other things that, we, that are not actually listed on there, particularly some of the viral infections. We also uh, undertake surveys in livestock markets. Uh, this is very active surveillance looking at uh, a, a particular network of livestock markets that provide this, uh, that serve this region and serve both local and regional trade. So that gives us the ability to understand how, what is moving in and out of this region. And we effectively do the similar things that we do in the household but at the market level. Within the household level then, we're also interested in how the animals that are in that household are interacting with their natural environment. We heard this morning about uh, uh, interactions between individuals and, and the wild environment, if you like. This particular environment is, is somewhat less wild, but there are wild features to this environment and understanding the exposure of livestock and of people to that is really important. So here is uh, uh, some data on the spatial ecology. Uh, the, the big graphic in the middle is ac actually refers to dogs. Uh, this one is cattle, and the, other, the one up there refers to pig movement data, really trying to understand how domestic animals are using their natural environment and what particular features of the landscape they're being most exposed to. And very interesting things come out of that. So. Uh, animals that are not tethered move around as much at night as they do during the day. They interact with some key, house, uh, key environmental uh, components or, or uh, anthropogenic components like latrines, for example, in the case of pigs. Um, and very importantly, they aren't restricted in their movements to the, to the households or indeed only the villages where, from which they come from, but they roam much more widely. And therefore, interventions to control many of the diseases that they may be carrying can't necessarily bo be fo focused, for example, in the case of a disease like cystosicosis, at only pig-keeping households, but because those pigs are using a much more extensive part of the environment than, than we otherwise realized. Then there's the people in these households. And uh, we effectively do the same thing in the people, surveillance of a range of health, uh, uh, markers of health, as it can same disease uh, as related to economics that, uh, that I talked about before. And the, the hospital is also essential here. So this, this, these human surveys are of otherwise well people whom we survey, and uh, the hospital beds otherwise ill people who we also survey, routinely uh, s sampling uh, these populations through the healthcare setting over extended periods of time. Um, the households then are not uh, don't exist on their own in this in environment. They are connected through the products that they produce to the wider system, to the health, to the food system in particular. Um, sometimes the food that is produced in these households is consumed by the households. Other times it's sold onto the market and, and, and goes much further afield. So at the household level, wanting to understand well, what people eat and where they get it from, and then at the food system level that those households are connected to, how is livestock source food distributed and traded? Uh, what, what shape and form do the value chains that those livestock products uh, move along take? Um, and what, where are the disease risks within that uh, chain? And our focus up to now has largely been on uh, a group of uh, tractable diseases like cystosicosis, brucellosis, and um, the bacterial pathogens like E. coli and salmonella. Um, where we've been undertaking surveys in, in abattoirs, sampling at retail sites, 
and, and also undertaking some, some risk assessment through that process, uh, the sort of work many of you will, will, will also be undertaking in government systems, for example. And then within the, the, the slaughterhouse system, uh, those people who work in the slaughterhouse are also sentinels for disease. They're being exposed to uh, animals that are being slaughtered all the time, um, and they are also a specific risk group that is often forgotten in terms of the, the targeting of these kinds of things. So the food chain and how these animals are, how these households are linked into that food chain is really important. And finally, and I won't say very much about this, the wider environment around these households is a, it does have, well, what we call peri-domestic wildlife. It's the, we're not on the edge of national parks here. This is very much an agricultural environment. Um, but there are many things in, potentially, in those, in those wild species that deserve to be surveyed for. Some of the types of tools that we heard about this morning are very applicable in, this, in those populations. Uh, for, the, for the most part, up to now, we've been focusing on bacterial pathogens and how wildlife is spreading bacterial pathogens between households, between people and, and livestock. So I promised you at the beginning some lessons, and uh, I'll, I'll just run through those. These are uh, very simplified versions of, of some of the many lessons that we can draw from this kind of thing. Uh, but first of all, uh, uh, co-infection and polyparasitism are extremely important. And um, it, it becomes really important in the context of understanding the entire health burden of a population such as this to move away from specifically understanding only one pathogen or one host and really understanding many of those together. And that's kind of my idea of what One Health really is all about. Uh, relating to the, the, the wealth status, how poor you are really matters. There is great heterogeneity in infection risk uh, and uh, wealth has a direct bearing on, on health status. Even this is uh, at first sight already a, a, a poor corner of Kenya, but within that poor corner of Kenya where there is a lot of variation um, based on, on wealth status. Where you live within that region or the region being studied matters. Spatial parameters, which natural resources you have access to and, and to which you're exposed, really important. What you eat really matters. For example, cystosicosis uh, is uh, very prevalent in the pig population, and for every 100,000 people, 2,000 infectious meals are eaten annually in this population. The origin of food matters, as we saw from the, the work that we're doing in the slaughterhouses and in the markets, understanding where food is coming from and what people are eating and being exposed to is really essential. Not all diseases matter, though. I'm, I don't want to stand here and say all of these things are really important. In this particular setting, for example, brucellosis is simply not important. We expected it would be, and it was one of the things the government wanted to prioritize in this region, but simply it is not important, and uh, its, its perceived importance was simply a function of the poor diagnostic testing that's undertaken in hospitals, highlighting the importance of also working in the hospital setting rather than just in the community. Um, and unexpected diseases might also matter. So we've discovered in this region, which had previously blank space on the map with regards to Rift Valley fever, for example, that there is evidence of circulation of Rift Valley fever in, the, in this community, both in the animals and in the people at low levels, but nonetheless it's there, and so on and so forth. Um, just highlighting also drug use, the last point there, drug use matters. Uh, levels of antibacterial resistance in animals correlate very strongly to patterns of drug use and misuse is rife, uh, both in the animal and in the human sector here, and that's obviously an emerging area for research. Um, secondly, um, the, the sort of more overarching point that I want to make is that complex One Health research such as this, where we really try and target all the components of these populations, can be done on a locally meaningful scale. And we need to move away from the one host, one pathogen, one outcome approach. And doing that is cost effective, does provide very key additional insights, uh, and requires, importantly, good, really good data systems for disentangling all of these things. And from a policy perspective, these kinds of integrated approaches are important because they, they point towards integrated policy understanding that these, this group of endemic diseases can be treated as a whole when thinking about how we might intervene to, to address behaviors, for example, that encourage disease transmission. 
And we want to, of course, move our system of surveillance beyond research, and we're doing that, moving our, our, our research into more into a policy engagement uh, arena, working with, in Kenya, we're very lucky that there is the, the, Zo Zo the Zoonotic Disease Unit, which is the one health coordinating body for the country, who are hungry for the kinds of evidence that we're, we're providing on these important but neglected diseases that they struggle otherwise to prioritize, because in the absence of the kind of evidence base that we're able to provide, it's impossible to raise the profile of these conditions. So evidence and data are, are, are clearly key, and um, I would say that the biggest challenges here, having gone through the challenge of establishing these kinds of surveillance systems, is to understand how to better work with the large volumes of data that these kinds of projects provide, and I notice there's a, a workshop uh, tomorrow uh, addressing specifically that issue. Um, what, what do we do with that information with respect to reacting to it and, and, and intervening to prevent these infections? And, and very importantly also, how do we raise awareness in the professional groups and in the public to, uh, to uh, engage better with this kind of surveillance system into the future? Of course, all of this takes lots of funding, so thank you to the people on the organizations on top who fund this work. Thank you to the organizations on the bottom who we collaborate with and to all the people in the picture who are the ones who actually do the work. Uh, so it's a big team effort. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions or a short comments in the audience? Then wave, you can get the microphone. I don't see you. You are doing this in this very dense populated spot, but are there other places who are doing the same, with the same kind of surveillance, local surveillance around the area right now? Uh, are you teaming up with, with any other? So there, there, are, there are other similar kinds of approaches, particularly where there are long established demographic surveillance system sites that have been uh, set up, and there are several of those around the world. This is not one of those. This is uh, separate from that system. But they tend to be focused on specific disease uh, issues rather than taking this much wider approach, particularly involving the animals at the same time as the humans. So uh, there may be, uh, but to my knowledge, this is one of the, the, the only big studies that, that attempts to combine particularly the animal and human side at the same time. And, and in order to make a real change mm -hmm. in Kenya, for example, uh, how many of these kind of researches do you need? Oh, well, no. uh, Depends how much money is available to do, to do the work. But, 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 but what I would say, I, I'd sort of take a slightly different ap approach to that and say that it, it's more about abstracting out of that the essential key messages, bits of, uh, bits of, of, uh, of evidence that can allow policy to deploy using, the, using the, this kind of approach as, as a means to make decisions rather than necessarily repeating this a hundred times in one country. I'm not sure that would necessarily be the best use of resources, but certainly across a range of uh, ecological settings and different, different uh, uh, socioeconomic setups, different um, ethnic uh, groups and so on, doing this kind of thing would be uh, useful. Because in, in the end of the day, it's the policymakers who has mm -hmm. to do something about this. And, and you say they're listening mm -hmm. to you, but at the same time, there are different researches going on with that are not One Health. How do you combine this? And, and so uh, it's about making this kind of thing relevant mm -hmm. and uh, not necessarily that all the resources are suddenly going to be turned towards addressing Rift Valley fever or, or Q fever or mm -hmm. something like that, but, but, but actually integrating this kind of information with the other routine kinds of information and, and assisting those people who make decisions to, to at least give a nod to this kind of uh, issue uh, uh, into the future. And when do you think there will be a decision outcome? or Are there already policies uh, yes, uh, yes. That are concerned. Well, policies, I'm not sure. Actions, yes. yes. Saying that they are policies might be a step too far. Yeah, okay. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Eric. Big applause. <laughs>